like in, in defining like what that ideal version of you is so that you can always compare yourself to what you want the best of yourself to be. Yeah. That's perfectly within your control, right? If Ladies and gentlemen, if you're hearing this, you'll once again tune in the consequence of have a podcast. This is your host, JT. Hey, quick reminder, this show, um, our workshops, our programs, everything we're doing at Consequence of Habit, it is not possible without the support of the listeners, uh, corporations, individuals, people that are, are like-minded and find value in, in, our, in our mission. So if you'd like to be one of those people, you want to support what we're doing here at the, at the Consequence of Habit 501c3 nonprofit, then, then I urge you to head on over to consequenceofhabit.org. Show us a little love. Give us a little support. All right, this week on the podcast, we're, we're joined by Dale Walls. Dale is the founder of Lion's Guide. He's a high-performer coach and advisor, a workshop facilitator, podcast of an amazing, uh, amazing podcast called Lion's Guide. I, I was fortunate enough to be interviewed on a ways back. He's also a guy, when I hit him up and said, hey, would you be willing to come on the podcast? He said, absolutely. And then he drove an hour to my house, kicked my ass on a three-mile run, uh, and then we sat down and, and shot this interview, or recorded this interview. Dale's an inspiring dude. Like I said, I think I said, he's a Marine veteran. Uh, learned some skills in the Marines. He, he did something not, not many people do, is, is he learned something in the military, something that translated over on the civilian side. And you're going to hear in this interview, he just, man, he just, kicked life in the ass. Um, super motivational dude, a person I consider a friend and, and definitely somebody I will be interacting with, um, partnering up with here in the near future. This next message goes out to all my beer snobs out there. If you're listening to this and you enjoy a high quality beer, I don't care what kind of beer it is. It could be a light beer. It could be an IPA. It could be stout porters, whatever it is. And I want to ask yourself, has my love of really good beer been the root cause of feeling like crap the next day? I'm not talking about completely hungry, maybe just, maybe just a little under the weather. I got the solution. Check out athleticbrewing.com. These guys are making the finest quality craft beers out there. They just don't have that poison in them. So whether you're just trying to show up as a parent, as an employee at a sporting event, whatever it is, you just want to be clear-headed. Or maybe you're like me, you just want to be sober. Well, then do yourself a favor, go to athleticbrewing.com, use the promo code capital COH20, and you're going to get 20% off your first order. So without further ado, please welcome to the podcast, Dale Walls. This is the first. I'm here with Dale Walls from Lion's Guy. Mm -hmm. Dale, um, we just got done with a three-mile run. Uh, I'm going to point out the fact that it, it's a good thing you were talking for, for the good part of it, and I, and I didn't have to. Uh, because I was, I was clearly I was going to ask, how, how'd you make out? How, uh, how are you feeling? Yeah, I, was, yeah I, I, I admitted to you afterwards that I started running about a week and a half ago. Because this, literally, you pointed out that you were dead on when you said, oh, because because we were going for a run, and you were absolutely right. So um, I appreciate you coming up. You, yeah. came, you came up uh, from, from you're in, are you in Baltimore, or are you, are you on yeah, the Eastern I'm Shore? In, I'm in God's country, man, down yeah, on the Eastern there. Shore. So I just shoot straight, straight up as far up. as how where long, we are. How long did it take to get here? 49 minutes for the, for the Google, for the Mr. Google. Drove up, we hit a run and uh, now we're going to do, we're going to do an interview, man. So yeah. thanks for making the trip. Thanks for motivating me to get out and get on the trail and do a little bit of run. Yeah, that's my job, man. Cool. Uh, so I was fortunate enough to be on Lions Guide. I got, it had to be I don't know, eight months ago or so. It had to be within last year. I'm coming up on a year. So definitely probably last September or something like that. Yeah. So anytime I get to, to do something, get to be on one, I said this, that was one of the first ones I was a guest on. And you kind of point out the fact that, yeah, uh, it's a little bit easier sitting on the other side and you're absolutely right. Um, but, but to, to have you on mine and, and full transparency, I didn't know much about your story prior to, to coming on online sky. Mm. Um, I've, I've looked into a little bit more and, and dude, you got, you've, you've been on one hell of a ride, my friend. Uh, yeah, I would say so. Now, had I been on, I've been on this podcast before. No. I haven't been on Consequence of Habit yet. Never. 
you just came online. Look at that. Yeah, look at that. Holy crap, man. Yeah. I was I was riding up here thinking this is like my second time this on. Is, this is the second go around. No. no. Oh, no. man. Because I was wondering, I was going to ask you before show, I was like, we already covered my story the first time, right? Yeah. I don't know what, I guess just your podcast come in just is yeah. what I'm thinking. Yeah. Maybe. Oh, yeah. Well, that changes my game for today. This, <laughs> this is fun. Um, One hell of a ride. Yeah, man. Um, Where shall we begin? All right. Let's start off with... One thing that anyone who follows your stuff knows that you're a Marine. You're very mm-hmm. proud to have been a Marine. It's always Marine, right? Like that. Yeah. Um, let, let's let's kick it off. You're you're in high school or you're in college, and you decide you're going to be a Marine. What what did that process look like for you? So yeah, I mean, I come from you know blue collar bedroom community town. Um, you know, father's been out of my life for the majority of it. Um, so I was actually raised like you know we lost our house and to divorce and all that. I was in the second grade. I do remember that. Um, and I went and lived with my mother and grandmother um, at my grandmother's house. Um, so that's, what, seven years old. And um, I guess around the time I was five, um, my grandfather had had a stroke debilitating. So he was, like, uh, wheel- wheelchair-stricken. And so here I am. Like, my mom had me young. She had me at, like, 17. Wow. Um, here I am now seven years old. So she's mid twenties, wow. you know, trying to figure her own life out. Sure. And my dad's gone. Um, and we're living with my grandmother with my disabled grandfather in a two bedroom house. So my mom and I actually bunked up in the attic and uh, up until my f- grandfather's passing, like we shared a bed, like, you know, like I was a kid, you know, sharing a bed with my mom up in my grandmother's attic for uh, a, a stint. And, um, so as you can imagine, I didn't have much going for me, like sure. um, chasing uh, the images set forth by like my friends who had money or whatever, just trying to keep up with them. But I was not the kid that had the latest Jordans. And, right, right. you know, I came up, you know, I'm 1980 baby. So I came up through the Attitude Era, which was awesome. Um, I'm a... Um, I'm a thankful what they call Xennial. So I'm in between the Gen X's and the millennials. Um, and I, I love that because, you know, I kind of feel like I had the best of both worlds, like the pre-internet and then there at the beginning of the internet. Yeah. But anyway, so uh, just just a kid without a vision, without a cause, without guidance, right? So my grandfather's debilitated, no father figure in my life. My other grandfather's passed away. Like, so I've got no real male figure. And so... Um, and I was going through school. I didn't give a crap about anything, you know, school schmool. I'm not going to college. So who gives a shit about school? Like whatever, as long as I'm showing up, I'm passing, you know, but didn't care. Um, uh, having fun, not get doing anything nefarious trouble wise, but mischievous, like see what, see how far we can push the thing. But, but I had, you know, especially I would say living with my grandmother, um, in, uh, I was raised by my grandmother and my mother. Again, my mother was young. So she's working. She's yeah. working two jobs. She's also trying to live a life. I'm spending a ton of time with my grandmother, who was one of 14, you know. One of uh, 14? Yeah, yeah. So she grew up on a farm. She was one of 14. It was She was one of three girls, and the rest were all boys. Um, Good God. So she just celebrated her 94th uh, birthday. But um, So I spent a ton of time with her. And I think that... Um, grounded me in a way of like a sense of morality i think comes from that era you know what i mean of work ethic you know right and wrong and stuff like that um and so that's why i think i don't really i never i knew what was wrong wrong right i I like to have fun but i knew what was wrong um and so we did the things all through high school but um you know i had a chip on my shoulder you know i was freaking 120 pounds soaking wet, you know, but I was a lot of talk and, yeah. you know, trash talk run my mouth and ton of heart. Um, and one day, junior year, high school, um, you know, my buddy had his truck vandalized, long story short, and someone was walking through the hallway as he's telling me about it. Someone's walking through the hallway like, hey, man, you want to know who did your truck? You got to make the finger symbol like you pay up. And I just kind of lose it in the hallway. And it's me and this kid agree we're going to fight after school. And the dude's like, hey, man, well, I know where you live, Walls. I'll, I'll be at your house after school. I'm like, good, man, my friend, you know, let's go. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. So the whole school hears about it. Everyone's at my house, my little neighborhood, waiting for this kid to show up. It doesn't show up. And I'm, I'm doing my thing. I'm barking, like, mm-hmm. you know, talking yeah. shit. And, um, and someone in the crowd goes, well, I know where he lives. 
And like, oh no, well, fuck it, let's go. Yeah. And so we have a caravan. You know where Kent Island is. Uh-huh. We have a caravan go from Centerville to about twenty minutes away, Kent Island. I roll up in this kid's house. He's outside washing his truck. He's got a little Toyota S10 or whatever. And catch him by surprise. Like he's like, whoa, shit. Like, yeah. oh, you were for real. I'm like, yeah, yeah, we're fucking throwing down, son. Like, and so we kind of leave his house, go to a local park, throw down, and it's a it's a bloody mess, shit show. Like he catches me, I'm bleeding. Like it's it's a it's a shit show. And so um, I leave there, fights over. They drag us out. I'm covered in blood. He's covered in blood. Like I mean, covered. And uh, I go. I remember going to the local Exxon, going to the bathroom, just kind of clean up. And I look in the mirror, I'm like, oh shit, you know. And um, there's no hiding it, right? Like there's no hiding it. So I have to go home, get home. My grandmother sees me first. And is like, what the hell? Right. Like she's losing it. Um, my mom comes home, she's losing it. And so my mom takes me to the hospital that night. I had to get stitched up, um, in, inside of my lip to do, put my, put my bottom lip through my bottom teeth. Mm-hmm. And, um, the, <laughs> I'm sitting in the hospital. I just got the Novocaine needle in my bottom lip, um, which hurts like a sure. mf -er. And, um, my mom's sitting in a corner and the nurse or whoever did it walks out and I see my mom kind of like hurt. Um, she's sitting in the corner and now just before that, we get this letter in the mail inviting me to go to boy state, which was the American Legion puts it on. It's like a week, week long boot camp. Uh, this one was out in Westminster, Maryland. And, um, so I'm sitting there and my mom's sitting in the corner and she's, she kind of looks at me kind of, I imagine she has tears in her eyes type of thing is the way I see it today. And she's kind of looks at me and goes, well, you go to boy state. And I, and I think to me is that was the first time that I really felt the hurt I was causing, right? Like, cause up until then it was all about me and I wasn't, you know, I didn't care. And I, I don't think I really saw, you know, that the things I was doing, the effect it had on other people. And now as an adult, I see, cause being a parent's a bitch, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. So I mean, you've got three kids. I mean, it's a lot of work. And so now I kind of see, you know, now I'm, I'm, you know, being this kid, and uh right wrong or indifferent on why but um you know being this kid so i finally saw like the impact and i go yeah i'll go i'll go to boy state so um that summer you know so this is now the summer of my junior senior year i go to boy state and uh it's hosted by the american legion but it's you know run by marines yeah and i had no exposure to the military at all um and it's like a boot camp, but you're going through these different challenges and whatever. How old are you at this point? Um, I'm 17. 17, okay. 17. Um, so um, I'm at, at Boy State for this week, but you gotta, you're got going through all this boot camp type stuff and classes and like little political voting things or whatever. Um, but um, I don't remember much of Boy State other than, um, you know, you had to do duties. You, know, you had to stand shifts. Sure. And so... Um, the corporal in charge of our platoon. I remember one night I'm on shift and this corporal, like he comes back, he's like, he had been drinking. I could tell. Yeah. <laughs> and he's like sitting with me, you know, in the, the stairwell while I'm on duty and just kind of talking to me like, Hey man, why are you here? What are you doing? And, and he just kind of like starts talking to me about the Marine Corps. And, um, I came back and, uh, I depped in that summer. Like I came back and was on a mission. Like I'm going to be a Marine. um, enlisted before my senior year. So I was in, I was delayed enlistment program through my senior year of high school, which changed everything. Now I had a purpose right now. I was going to be a Marine. So Marines get good grades. Marines put into work. Marines, you know, get ready for boot camp. Like, so I'm like, I'm going to be who I need to be to be a Marine. And things started to change for me. Um, Still was sloughing off some of the, the wildness in me, but um, I, I had a, directive so to speak um so joined the marine corps and really just got exposed to my potential at that point and that what was, was it was this camp was it almost like a scared straight thing was it for kids in trouble or was this just for anybody that would that like anyone could sign up for? No, i think you had to have a certain gpa um okay, okay. And it was like an invitational to uh soon to be seniors i understand you know? i got you so all right uh all right so you graduate and then you're right off into the to the marines 
uh, pretty much I was around that summer and um, I went to Paris Island like the end of August. So <laughs> good time to land on. Oh, hell yeah. That, yeah. That had to be brutal. Yeah. Yeah. And it doubled it, and it got worse, right? Like, because I went from Paris Island at the end of summer and that put me in uh, uh, Lejeune for combat training through the winter. So, <laughs> like, I <laughs> got the. That's the, the heat rules. of the summer on Paris Island and and was it uh Buford? Is it Buford? Man, I'm losing it now. But yeah, down there Paris Island and then went to Lejeune through the winter and now now what year is this? Uh ninety eight. Okay. All right. All right. So you do you do how long uh, in the Marines? Four years. Four years. Okay. And what was your job? I was basically an IT specialist. So I was in there at ninety eight to two thousand two. I was in at a time where being the computer guy, you did everything. Like yeah, yeah, I knew it all. Like I could pull fiber, I could build servers, I could fix computers, everything. Did you know at the time like that that these <clears throat> skills that you're learning are going to to manifest themselves on the civilian world into ways that you probably couldn't imagine? Um, yes, because you know there was those in my MOS like didn't stay in because here we were getting paid less than minimum wage. And you get out and you're making, you're starting at 80 plus thousand dollars a year. So, so yes, I kind of knew like the opportunity outside the, the core. Um, and I got married young. I, I don't, I, I didn't join the Marines to make a career of it. I joined the Marines to uh, be a Marine first and foremost, uh, get a job, you know, career. Cause I wasn't going to school. Like school wasn't for me. And I'm sure you hear this all the time, right? Yeah. Wasn't for me at that time for sure. Um, but, um, but not that I had money for school anyway, like we had right. nothing. Right. Um, so my parents didn't have money for college. My parents didn't go to college. No one in my family had gone to college. Um, so we didn't have, you know, so I joined the Marines to be a Marine, uh, get a job trade, uh, get college money. So I did get like 50 grand of college money between a GI bill and um, my college fund and all that. Um, and and I did my four and got out. I got promoted quick. I just what was a 300 PFT or meritorious guy. Like, so I, I was two years, five months a sergeant wow. in charge of the platoon and, you know, yes, wasn't even amazing. 21 yet. So I was, but that was just like, like say I got snapped on, you know, the Marine Corps opportunity starting at Boy State kind of snapped me in going, okay, fuck this. Like what, yeah, what yeah, can yeah. I be? And it, it, I tell people like it kind of exposed me to my potential you know, to, to a degree. Yeah. You're, and you're not the first, right? Like I, I've heard from lots of different people that come on here that they didn't realize what they were incapable of. And the Marines or the military was that, that thing that triggered that. And yeah. they're like, Oh man, I, I had no idea that I was even, this was even in the cards for me. Yeah. Now when you went in, you know, you already mentioned like, Hey, this wasn't going to be a career. Uh, I wanted to learn a skill. So you went in knowing like this IT side is the direction I want to go because it's going to transfer on the civilian side. Yes. Yes. Um, I did. I, I, I don't know that anyone told me that. It was just it, what, what you do the, well, I had a, you know, coming up in the late nineties, right. We had dial up, we were playing sure. doom and Duke Nukem sure. over to dial up and stuff like that. I and, remember. and with my cousin, like we were playing in that world. So I kind of like enjoyed the trade of it, um, and knew that it had potential beyond the Marine Corps. Um, so, uh, so yeah, I think, um, it was just something I knew natively that I wanted to not just go shoot M16s all day. I wanted to get a trade, but what I liked about the Marine Corps is like, you're, every Marine's a rifleman. So you still got you that. Still, right, right, right. Um, and I did enjoy that aspect of the Marine Corps that we were Marines first and then our, our jobs, so to speak, were how we contributed to the mission of the Corps, you know, mm -hmm. but it was, I won't say secondary, but like kind of, you know, it, you're, your first infantryman, you know, yeah. so to speak. But but there there's there's something about this dynamic of you think of an IT person, right? And you've got this this thing in your mind, and then you think of a marine, and those two don't necessarily. And that's not to say that there's there isn't extremely capable people within the marines in that in that world, but it's not the first thing that comes to mind. Mm -hmm. So you, you get out in what two thousand one, two thousand two, yeah, two thousand two. Okay. What does that transition look like for you? Because I imagine to to come from this this uh, world of a marine, which it doesn't matter what your job is in the marine. They're, they're like you said, you're a marine first, and there's a way of doing things. And then come out. Um, what did that process look like? Did you just jump into an IT company? Uh, walk us through that. Yeah, I had a job lined up before I got out, um, which was a bit 
of an issue because uh, we were amidst post 9-11, like we're at ground zero on that, right? Because here we are, 2002, my EAS is August 2002, and shit's hitting the fan, right? Because we had just landed in Afghanistan. But, but sorry, before we move forward, because I'm, what did that feel like? Did you struggle with that as far as the getting out during that time? And the only reason I asked is I got it right before 9-11. I'm living in California. I had just gotten out and then this, this thing kicks off Yeah, and you know, you spend, uh, you, I was in a little over five years. You spend this time preparing for something, then it happens and you're not part of the show. And, and I, I internally struggled a bit with that. So mm. what was your experience around that? Um, I, it was mixed. Um, you know, I was, I had a job lined up to get out. So I had, you know, and I um, wasn't my plan to stay in. Sure. So there's this part of, you know, wanting to go fight, but also wanting to move on. Mm-hmm. Um, now, I was fortunate. I could have got held in. I had sergeants around me that were getting held in. Um, and in fact, like were requesting mass to get out because they were getting held in, you mm-hmm. know, by their, their command. And, um, because we were all in a field, like, because they had similar things going on. Like, we had sure. a life outside of the Marine Corps that we were heading towards. Um, and so I was indifferent to a point. I would have gladly went overseas and did whatever if that's what was ordered of me. But I was also married. Mm. Um, you know, I'd been married for two years at that point. Uh, my wife got and I got married in, in the middle of my enlistment. Um and, and, you know, I have a lot of empathy, you know, people always say like, thank you for your service. And I go, well, don't forget about the, the family and the supporters because they're, they're going through it too. Like, and so that wasn't lost on me, mm. um, of, especially at that time, as volatile as it was, as unpredictable as it was, um, what that would do to my family. Did you have kids at gone. this point? No, not right. yet. But, um, but you know, we were slated to deploy earlier that year, and it just kept getting pushed back until my EAS. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, we were kind of planning for me to be gone sure. earlier that year anyway, which meant I was, my EAS yeah, yes, was cooked, um, you know, as far as it was going to be pushed back. So, you know, I was in this weird, 2002 was weird in that, like, I was supposed to go in January, and Israel and Palestine started blowing each other up. Yeah. And, and then it was like, hey, we're pushed a week. And, and even at that time, like we were going to go to Iraq, like, and, and this is early 2002, um, we were slated to go to Iraq. And so I had made those calls home to say, Hey, I not, can't tell you where I'm going, but we're sure. gone. And that was January. Uh, we were slated to go. Um, I was with FSSG. Um, we were going to go support first Marines. Um, and it was like Israel and Palestine started blowing each other up. And it's like, Oh, hold up. We're, we're pushed a week. And then a week goes, all right, we're pushed two weeks. Ah, we're pushed a month. And we ended up doing a workup in 29 Palms instead of deploying, and that ran into my EAS. Anyways, um, I was I was a good Marine. Like, I, I got promoted fast, sure. was always in charge, um, led in a lot of different ways. Um, and so my uh, master guns and colonel of my unit basically pulled me in and go and said, Hey, Sergeant Walls, service is no longer required. Thank you for your service. And said, we're going to let you out on time, you know? And, and it was really like, like, I don't know. It, it, it was really like a great f- feeling of recognition in a way that like I, I gave my Mar- the Marine Corps, Marine, every Marines, everything I had. And that was my plan. Like go give it all I've got for four years. And I don't, th- think I was worried about not getting out on time again. Like who, like, so you're going to send me to Afghanistan. I'm going to, so what, whatever, yeah, like, right, yeah right, right. you know, that's, that was fine. But at the same time to get pulled down amongst this controversy in our unit of like people fighting, getting held in and, and all that stuff to kind of be sat down and said, say, sorry, Walls, man, you've done great for us and Th- go home about your life. And which was awesome. Like it was, it was like a really, um, it was, it was, and again, I've, shame to admit it but it, like it was a relief it was you know because sure. again there's if, if i was single like let's go you know but my wife and family and just that 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 bugged me uh, a part about the deployment aspect i, I guess it would rightfully so yeah um, well, yeah 100 you know, um, i mean 
I mean, you're right. It's like these decisions that you make or whether they're made for you. I mean, they have ramifications, right? You're not, you're, you're serving the, the country and the U.S. Marines, but there, there's always, there's always family back and, and they suffer, right? Yeah. They're, they're part of it. They're part of it. So, um, all right. So you're getting out in 2002. It's, it's a, I imagine it's a unique experience. You get out with this, this qualification that you know is, is sought after. You know that there's people mm-hmm. lining up to, to, for you, for you to, to go work for a company now. Now, did you come back to Maryland or is this, where's this company? I did, came? did, came back, came back kind of kicking and screaming because I was stationed in 29 Palms, or at 29 Palms. No, I was not stationed in 29 Palms. I, I did work at 29 Palms. I was stationed at Camp Pendleton. And so I'm there five minutes to the beach, you know, yeah. 30 minutes to San Diego, 40 minutes to LA. Like I'm in an awesome spot. You never need to check the weather because you know it's going to be 75 sure. and sunny tomorrow. You know? now, is, like, that where, is that where your wife is, is from? No, she, we're high school sweethearts. Ah, really? So, um, so uh, but she was very family oriented. And like I said, she had spent half my enlistment out there with me. And, you know, so, um, so I, I felt like I wanted to give back to her and said, Hey, you came with me. We've been away from home. Let's go back and be closer to your family or whatever. So, um, so we came back home and, um, I went and started with the contractor department of state, you know, you had the clearances and so on. So I just went, went and started working. Um, but while I was in the Marines, I had started doing it services out in town. So I like had six or so clients that why you're why you're in well, i was in yeah yeah oh, dude you go get her yeah <laughs> so i would um i was serving these small businesses out in town and that kind of just happened by way of you know it's like you meet someone at a networking event and they go i'm a doctor and you go hey doc in my shoulder, my shoulder yeah. you know um so i would be at these events like my wife's work or whatever and her boss would be like oh you do computers like, yeah and, and, and always like and this would date the times like they pull out their blackberry and go hey man well my blackberry you know, my calendar on my BlackBerry doesn't match what's on my desktop right. and this thing and blah, blah, blah. And I would go do, do, do and fix it. And then I'm a hero. And so I really liked that. I like taking what I know and serving others. Um, so I started with my wife's, you know, company that she was working at, like serving their computers. And that grew into, like like I said, a handful, half a dozen of clients. Um, just billing by the hour stuff. And while I was still out there, um, my wife and I took the opportunity. We went and watched uh, Tiger Woods play golf at um, Torrey Pines. And I remember walking around with her and telling her, like, hey, if we get back home, like, I'm, I think I'm going to, like, start a business with this, like, do it for real. And um, and that was it. I, I just kind of committed to that. I came back. I took the State Department gig but started kind of laying the framework to start a company. And I started an IT services company. What was it about being out there at this thing? Like, what what was it about being at this event uh, that something clicked? No, nah, I, I don't know that that clicked. I, was, I just recall me telling her that, okay. like, hey, I like this. And again, it was like just, I don't know, it was different. It wasn't the normal path. It was just like, because, you know, traditionally it was get out, go get a high-paying job, you know, with your skills and whatever, and, and fall into the system. And here I was like, you know, I like what I'm doing, you know, with serving businesses the way I'm doing it. Because again, the timing wise, we're early 2000, still 2002. So we're in the dot com, you know, era, like everyone was just starting to get broadband. Like it wasn't, everyone, everyone's got broadband now. We got it in our pockets. Yeah. But back then, you know, you were lucky to be in an area that had like cable internet. And um, anyways, um, so, but meanwhile, so what I, what I like to say is like, in the Marine Corps, like the network I served was like 7,500 users. So we did, we had everything, like at a data center, like whatever. Um, but small, medium businesses were like the BlackBerry example, were just now getting access to enterprise class technology, right? Technology that was traditionally only reserved for the, the GEs and mm-hmm. the big companies. Um, so anyways, um, I had a unique skill set that small businesses needed but they couldn't afford to hire like a full time person to come yeah. do this stuff. So, um, you know, the the business idea was that like, hey, well, just you know, I I built a, a virtual IT department to sp- support a collection of small businesses, and that collection of businesses just grew. So, all right, so you so you end up start, starting your own company. Mm-hmm. Um, I love this idea of kind of betting on yourself. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, there's there's the easy way, like you kind of said, you, you you jump out. God knows there's enough contractors. It's not like a government job where or, where you, you know, it's a GS employee, but there's always work and it's mm-hmm. safe. Like you ne- you always know there's gonna be something. 
what did that process was that was that scary or did you kind of know like hey we've I've got something here that I know is kind of it's a proven thing all I got to do is kind of go you know put the work in and go through the process yeah I'd say my story isn't um, any different than what people are told today in starting a business right so I did take my job that I had lined up before I got out of the Marine Corps I took that and then started laying the framework for the business um, and started it um hired my cousin part-time, you know, and put an ad in Yellow Pages. and Because he was the type of guy that he knew the stuff better than I did, was oh, really? really a geek about it. Which I've never, you know, I tell people, like, I'm not I'm not even a tech geek. Like, I'll be honest with you. Like, I'm looking forward to the day that me and my wife live in a log cabin and I'm killing our dinner and chopping our heat, sure. you know, every day, right? Like, keep a keyboard away from me. But here we are yeah. running podcasts. Like, it's a, I'm trying to do some good with it today. Right. But at the same time, you know, I'm, I'm spent <laughs> on tech a bit. But anyways, um, I, uh, you know, hired my cousin who was really, uh, you know, passionate about it. But, you know, being in IT, especially back then, at least when there wasn't all these schools and all these things, you know, it was very what I call chicken and the egg. Like no one would hire you unless you had experience. But if no one will hire you, how are you going to get the experience? And so so I gave I hired my cousin because I knew like he was a hobbyist enough. And I had all this professional training that you know, it was a win-win that I could keep my day job. I could post this ad in the yellow pages. He would kind of start serving. And, um, and that's how I started. So I like, you know, and you hear that today with people's quote unquote side hustles, right? Like do it on the side until it gets to a point. And I, I would say I kind of did that same thing in hindsight. And so, oh, uh, we did that. And as we grew, um, where it really started to take a risk was once that was rolling, um, my wife was actually my second full-time employee because that the ads are working. My cousin's trying to serve the calls that are coming in for service as well as serve the clients. Um, and so I just brought in uh, my wife. I told her, I was like, all right, you're out of your job. You're going to, we're going to hire you. And, you know, so she was then like my first service coordinator. So she would just take the calls during the day. She would do all the billing. She would do all the admin stuff, stuff I didn't want to do anyway. Yeah. And, um, and then, and then my cousin got to do what he wanted to do, which was just serve computers, right? Like that's all you wanted to do. So, um, so that was that. And then about a year later, um, I left the state department gig and worked for a commercial provider um, who served commercial clients just to kind of learn. I wanted to get more into like, you know, how this business worked. Um, and while I was there, the state department called me back and say, Hey man, like I think it was Northrop was the prime. Um, they called me and said, Hey, how do we get you back in here? And I was like, well, let me tell you how you get me back in there. Uh, you hire my company, I'll come back. And so what I did then was now I got a contract rate for my time. So before I was a W2 employee under a subcontractor, now I was going back as a 1099, getting a great hourly. Um, but I was just keeping my salary and took all the extra, threw it in the business and it was off to the races from there. So hey, I want to take a break just to, uh, to give a little shout out to another organization and that's called the Patriot Fund. Patriot Fund is a, another 501c3 nonprofit uh, that, that are help, they're helping support us. Specifically, our veteran programs. This organization supports uh, active duty, reservist, and veteran organizations doing amazing things within those communities. If you guys want to see some of the work that they're doing, you want to you want to check out maybe support them. Check out thepatriotfund.org. So this thing clearly grows. Oh yeah. All right. So you go from from hiring your cousin and your wife. Now was there? I mean, you don't have to get too into detail about it, but but were there hiccups along? I mean, because you know, there's this whole thing of of there's a business in the side and there's a family side, and these things. I mean, that's that that can be kind of precarious of mixing those two worlds. Ooh, you're talking about like. Well, I've definitely learned um, <laughs> <laughs> not to hire friends and family since then. Sure. And I think I was like, yeah. I mean, a couple of things that I, I gotta acknowledge that it helped me along the way, which is one. I was in the Marine Corps in. Um, we get a lot of leadership training yeah. and I, I got exposure to that. But again, my Marine Corps time, I was 18 to 22. So I'm still a shithead 18 to 22 year old. So I'm not going to like talk like, even though I was a sergeant, I wasn't an a-hole 22 year old, Yeah, you know, probably wasn't a great leader in, in many ways, still developing, let's say. Um, and, and that holds true for, I would say like the first 
you know, five to 10 years in business as well. It's like I had to grow as a leader. Um, and, you know, cause certainly I was hiring people and, and running this business and serving clients and all that stuff. So, so I had to grow and mature. Um, so I would say like, so to what you're getting at, like what's the challenges of working with friends and family and all that, is it a challenge? Yes, but it's a challenge that can be solved for with good leadership. And I would say that helped me be a better leader um, to be able to navigate those things. Um, yeah, because I imagine it's a, it's a leadership style too, right? Because the leadership style that you're learning as an 18 year old Marine probably is not going to serve you when you're when you're working with your wife, right? Like it just those things aren't going to translate. So I, I, I imagine that you have to learn these skills on the fly, you know, there might be some fundamentals, but, but, yeah. um, messaging has to be, has to. <laughs> well, uh, well, tact is one of the Marine Corps leadership traits, but, um, but yeah. And I would say it wasn't just my wife. It was other people too, because here I was hard charging sergeant and, and I came as hard charging sergeant straight into the department of state working with government workers oh, yeah, yeah. who didn't know what hit them, you know, when I went there, because I'm like, well, don't, you know, I'm trying to speed that game up in a big way. And they're trying to find no offense to the government workers out there, but you know, not, they're trying things, trying to find reasons not to do things. Yeah. And I'm like, no, let's go and push, push, push. So, but I, I had one person tell me at one point, um, quite steadily, just in response to my tact and aggression, um, in my style, which was, Hey, you know, you're not in the Marine Corps anymore. And I'm like, way I see it is the fact I was in Marine Corps is our core differentiator, yeah, <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah. And so, um, it, which, which again was right or wrong, but again, it, it comes down to like my own maturity of leadership to recognize that. Yeah, sure. Like some things that work, when you're dealing with Marines who went through 13 weeks of Marine Corps boot camp mm -hmm. work because they've, they, they met a standard, let's say, but when you're out in the civilian world, like you can't, you, it probably isn't going to serve you to certain tactics that, you know, well, maybe. and and I think that's what I was kind of alluding at that, that you've got this it skill, but you're coming from the Marines. So when you're coming out of that, traditionally IT people aren't coming from the Marines, mm. right? They're coming from from an IT background. So you've got these two worlds that are mixing, and it's almost like a social experiment, I imagine, in some ways, right? Like you've got this way of, of doing things. Uh, it just so happens you also have this skill of IT, and, and I imagine there's a lot of people that at first, like, I don't, I have no idea how to even handle mm. this this person as, as, as a leader. Right. Um, all right. So moving forward, this, this company is clearly grows. What is, what is the time frame from, from the point you get hired on as the company, right? This, this, the mm -hmm. department of state hires this company. Um, how long does that go on? And then let's, let's get to the point where at some, you know, we're, we're going to get to this day where you punch out from this thing uh -huh. and, and, and then kind of move on from, from there. But, uh, walk us through how long does that, that process take from the time this you're, you're, you're up and running company grows and then, and then you're selling it. Yeah. I mean, so I technically incorporated that business in 2003. Um, quick, man, this whole thing, this is crazy. How fast this is, you're covering this thing, these things. And, and it is a small window of time overall. You mean? Or? Yeah. I mean, you're going from 98 going in 2002, you're out 2003. You're a company. Mm -hmm. That's dude. That's fast. Yeah. No. Um, and, you know, I had a lot of success in it because, like, you know, now today what I did, my vision for the business became an industry. Like, I jokingly tell people, like, so by 2006, I got a cold call from this business. So so from 2003 to six, like, I'm taking on clients. I'm operating the way I ran the network, you know, with our platoon in the Marine Corps, you know, enterprise IT management. Like, that was my secret sauce is, like, a lot of guys who are in the business of serving these small, medium businesses – they were like my cousin. Like they were just guys who knew how to re replace hard drives and build right. computers and stuff. Right. And I'm coming from managing 7,500 user network, like all this training, leadership, you know, field experience at this, this depth of exposure of skills, you know, IT skills. So they like the competition, like just, I, I, I had one guy one day, uh, prospect. I remember I, he was walking out as I was walking in. He called me after. He was like, well, I knew I wasn't getting that one because, you know, because I just had like, what a business would want. They so much. I had a story, right? Yeah. I had a story. I had the skills, you know, it was because there's a lot of trust in that 
business, right? Um, anyways, so, um, you know, so growing the business, um, had a lot of success. 2006, I got a cold call from a vendor and said, hey, we're looking, we've got the software for MSPs. And I'm like, what's an MSP? And they're like, well, they're what, that's what you are. And I'm like, what, what, what does that mean? And, and so managed service providers, which is the way people do IT business today. I didn't even know it was such a thing. I just kind of like, that's how I wanted to serve these small, medium businesses who could not afford a full-time IT guy. So I say, no problem. You just pay me a fraction based on how much what you've got. These guys are paying me a fraction. These guys are paying me a fraction. I'm going to build an IT department that I serve all you guys, basically. Mm-hmm. And that's, in essence, what a managed service provider is. But it was it, I, I joke with these guys today because I'm still friends with those guys and the vendor, and I say, man, yeah, I was doing I was an MSP before I knew I was an MSP, the OG of MSP, man. apparently, yeah. yeah. Um, so, anyways, uh, so then that enabled me because then I had software that was built for me because up until then I was just cobbling together enterprise class tools that I knew in serving this. Um, you know, these collection of small businesses. Anyways, um, 2010, I get a call from a gentleman in New York who says, hey, man, I got your name through, I think, the, through the same vendor I was referencing in 2006. He's like, hey, man, I, I heard you guys, you're doing good. Um, you know, we're in the city. Um, and they had traditionally done business one day, but they were trying to transition to the way I was doing business, weren't having much success, got pointed my direction. Long story short, uh, I ended up partnering with those guys. Um, I acquired their business, but in, in, it was really on paper I acquired them, but it was really a merger of equals. And I took this formula that I was having tremendous success with in cornfields and cow pastures of the <laughs> Eastern Shore, and took it into Manhattan. And that was just, you know, it blew up because then I just. Are you now? Are you moving up there at this point? Are no. You, no, you're still you're no, still in the cornfields. Stayed field. based out of Centerville. Uh, these guys synced up and, and, uh, I talked with, uh, those guys on January (laughs) and people in business will hopefully laugh at this, but, um, he, he'd been in business 10 years longer than I. So he had a ton of business experience that I didn't have. I was making all the young business mistakes, right? We didn't have any money. I was living like month to month on our expenses and you know, whatever. So I was, I was still learning like business, right? Um, they didn't teach me that in the Marine Corps. I was still learning that. But now I, I come across a, a guy um, who had a business for 10 years longer than me in Manhattan. So he knew how to, you know, he knew Navigate everything about stuff. Yeah, the money especially. So anyways, um, he um, he called me in January. Um, by April, we fully integrated our businesses together. And then in June, we signed the paperwork to do that. And that was, you know, what, like when two entrepreneurs get together and go, this makes sense, we're going to rock this, we just went in and we just, like I say, so, so people, so we took two, you know, multi-million dollar businesses and amongst ourselves integrated them and then talked to the lawyers. And I remember talking to the lawyers who were just doing the paperwork and I, and I, I learned this then, you know, I forget who said it in the meetings and I think, I think my partner, so, so the guy in New York, um, Larry, who ultimately became the CFO, he had a partner, Andy Broderick, and, and I shouldn't say any of this without, with my other partner who was in it with me, uh, from the Marine Corps, Dwayne Wagner. But anyway, Larry went on to become the CFO, but in that those initial meetings and we were doing all the paperwork and the lawyers were kind of giving us crap, like you did what? Like in the accountants were like, you did what? Like you're already operating together and whatever. I mean, it's a, literally a shotgun wedding of business. And um, I think Larry or someone said, like, look, we're just signing this, these papers, but our hope is we're going to sign these papers and we're going to stick them in a drawer and we're never going to look at them again, you know, as far as like the, the the acquisition documents. And And that was the truth. Like we just agreed that, we could take my formula and I could help his business and I didn't want to do it as a consultant. I was like, man, well, yeah, let's merge it together and do it. And, and what that did was it allowed me to share a bunch of hats, right? Like I wasn't great at the finance because I didn't know it, but he did. And so, but he wasn't great at this business I was having success with. So he got to be the CFO. I got to be the CEO. Dwayne got to, uh, you know, do more tech stuff. Andy got yeah. to do more customer stuff. So we had a really great partnership um, because we all knew our lanes and we all trusted each other. And and that was it. That was a one plus one equals three and took off from there. All right. So that's 2007. 2010. Yeah. 2010. Um, 
I mean, I, I love this idea of, of if you've got, you know, we were joking around in, in the car about like building Voltron, like everyone's got their piece. And when you find that person, right. And then you have this, this, this shared vision and everyone knows exactly what they're good at yeah. and you combine it. Um, I mean, it's a beautiful thing. It had to be a very cool thing to see this thing that you've started from the very beginning, uh, start building these different pieces, putting them together. And then this thing kind of takes off as a rocket ship. What, what was that feeling like to you on, on, I mean, did you just wake up and pinch yourself at times and be like, this is, this is just unbelievable, man. Or were you too, too far in into it? I don't know. I mean, like I was loving it. You know, we were, I, I enjoyed serving people. Like it was what I knew. Like mm-hmm. I loved building the team. Um, in reflection, when we get to Lions Guide stuff, it, it, I, I'll tell you that in reflection, I see now that what i loved about the business because again i wasn't a tech geek like i yeah. like i got it and i could make your laptop stand up and do a backflip but i wasn't like like these other guys that were like all oh, on the like latest beta coming out and this yeah, is all yeah, the yeah, things yeah. i was just like oh, whatever what, what how can we help people with it sure. and that's what i in, in hindsight i look back and go what it was was i enjoy serving people with what I know. Mm. And that was Corsica Technologies. That was a company that that I enjoyed bringing on. Like, so we talked about my cousin. A majority of my employees were first-time IT people because I would hire their potential, whereas other people wouldn't hire them because they didn't have experience. Yeah. Um, I loved creating that. I loved giving people jobs. I loved serving the clients. Like, I, I loved that. Um, and so... So yeah, I'd say a lot of ways it, it was a really great place to be um, in in that regard. It was it hard, yeah, because you know you wake up, you come in your office, like you got a computer problem. You know, I wake up, I got everybody's computer problem <laughs> right. every day, twenty four seven. I was running a twenty four seven operation. Wow. You know, we had a network operation center, so I had people staffed through the night. I was operating down here in Maryland. I was operating up in New York City. Like we had a lot going on. Was there ever a point where you're like, this is, this fucking, this is, I don't know if this is going to work. Not as far as a business was concerned. Um, You know, certainly as partners should, like we had our tiffs, but um, that was always, I'll give credit to all my three partners. Always at the end of the day, we acknowledged like our respective roles Mm. and like we would voice our disagreements but would say, but hey, man, it's your call. You know, I like I, I wouldn't do it that way, but it's your call. Yeah. You know, if you're going to live with it, then it's your call to make. And I, I, I do appreciate that. Um, You know, so so there was always that. Um, But and then 2017, just again, through networking, I kind of got an unsolicited offer to buy the business. And we had no people say, well, was, was this your exit strategy? Like. I never had an exit strategy like this. This was just go like this was go time. And um, and so we got an unsolicited offer, which made us kind of think like, OK, well, what what do we have here? So um, we ended up going through a process, a year long process of seeing what the business was worth. Yeah. And we ended up selling the business. Um, and I stayed on for another 18 months and quadrupled the business through acquiring other companies around the country. Um, and then that was it. Out. I see you punch out. What, what was it? 2019? 20. 2020. You're done. Mm-hmm. What are you, what are you 40 at that point? 40. 40. 40 years old. Uh, you, you, you've built, you've sold a company. I imagine, I don't know numbers. I imagine that you, you know, you weren't putting in for unemployment or looking for a job right away. Mm-hmm. What was that? How long did that last before? Because I, I, we're going to transition to Lions Guide. Mm-hmm. How long did that last before you're like, all right, I, I gotta, I gotta find something. I gotta figure out what to do with with not only my time but my vision, my purpose, all of that. Yeah, well, I mean, a part of it was in in selling the company. You know, if I had stayed in the Marines, I would have quote unquote retired. 2018. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I see where you're going with it. So even though I didn't have a exit plan, I did have this itch that was coming about where I was seeing folks I served with in 2017. Done. I'm retired. I'm retired. I'm retired. And I was kind of going like, you know, it would be nice to say I'm retired. Like now we, 
we know like they're not really retired and they're not going to a beach in Tahiti. Right, right, right. But they're saying they they did their twenty years, and I was kind of like, I mean, it would be nice to say that kind of you know, and 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 then ironically, like we're getting these conversations are happening about buying the business, which kind of started this. You know, it's crazy, like the law of attraction style yeah, things yeah, yeah, yeah. where you, you start shining the light on things and how things start to manifest. I don't mean to get woo woo, but you know, I've, I've got enough life experience. There's something there. And um, 100%. the, so this kind of transacts and stayed on, get out in the middle of 20. And yeah, I, again, I was, I wanted to start a t-shirt company, like <laughs> just like, you know, cause you see, I do the quotes online. Yeah. I had been doing lion's guide as an Instagram page for yeah i saw it before it became like i, I kept seeing this that I, I would see the lion's guide and i and i didn't know exactly what it was yeah i didn't know what it was either nah, that's it's, funny i don't know i still don't know what it is <laughs> but yeah. it's yeah. Uh, and, for, and for the record that that running shirt that you're wearing today the blue with the red stripe dude it's legit i love it you like that yeah you walked I, in i'll get like, you one the um well yeah, that's the marine corps blood stripe Oh, see, I don't know if I can wear it then. You can I wear it. I'll let you wear it. Stolen valor. Yeah. No. <laughs> um, but I did that. It's a, it's the navy blue with the red blood stripe on the back. But um, so I wanted to make t-shirts just because I just wanted something easy. You know, I didn't want to not do anything. But I was like, yeah, man, I've been you know, this Lions Guide thing was kind of putting this inspirational stuff out and um just truly for me, um, and just just kind of spitting it into the ether. And uh, I was working with a marketing strategist um, about, hey, I want to do this T-shirt company and whatever. And after a couple sessions, um, and this this was Luke Harlan, who's been on my podcast, and and, and he's he does a lot of stuff in coaching today as well in mindset. But he he's a native marketing guy, so I was talking to him about his marketing and um, services, and we're we're talking through the brand. And like the second or third session in, Luke goes, Dale, man. Like his by this point he's heard a whole story that you've just heard. He goes, Dale, like given everything that you've been through, everything you've done and accomplished, man, like you think the best you got to offer the world is t shirts? And I'm like, <laughs> like, what do you mean? And he's like, Well, you know, I think like there's other like founders, CEOs, or people that would love to like your input or sure. advisory or whatever. And at that call, I I was just like, Yeah, thanks, man. I appreciate it. Yeah, I, yeah, I yeah, took yeah. it as a compliment or whatever. But I slept on it, and you know, I would say the next day, I just kind of it hit me like, well, I reflected on my last two years at Corsica in leading our sale and acquisition, and because when I exited the company, we had two hundred people, and so my job became leading the leadership team, and so in reflection of that comment afterwards, I said, man, you know what? Like, I loved that shit. Like, yeah. I loved working with my direct reports who were leading big teams and helping them personally, professionally navigate their challenges. I loved that. I loved the team meeting where we brought all those same people in the room and, like, figured it out and 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 just solved problems. And so, and, and I loved, like, going, hey, man, go read this book or go, hey, here's how I used to do that or whatever. I just loved taking, again, what I knew and, and serving them. And so... I, um, I, I, my next call with Luke, I said, Hey man, you're right. We're pivoting. Like, I, I still want to do the t-shirts, but tell me how I do this coaching thing or whatever. So then we pivoted and he started kind of walking me through like that and, and whatever. And that's when like the lion's guide of today has come about in the last year, which is that like, I love taking what I know for the last two decades of leadership and transformation and growth and all these things and answering the question, which I always got hit with, you know, as I was growing the business, people will come and go, Dale, man, I don't get it, man. You're growing this business like gangbusters. You're in like rural Eastern shore, Maryland, killing it, but somehow you're in New York city, killing it. Like, and yet you still coach the youth football team. Your wife hasn't left you yet. You've been right. married for almost 20 years. You know, you're running marathons, you're doing jujitsu, like, and you still got a smile on your face, like, dude, what the, what are you doing? And, um, and today I, that's what I do. Like I help people like kind of like I did see the light of the Marine Corps, see my own potential, have clarity in what that means. Um, and so for me, like the, the, the tenets of Lions Guide is that like establish clarity, act courageously and lead the way. And that's because, you know, we have to have clarity, right. Of, where we're going, what do yeah. we need to know? 
Uh, truth is a big aspect of clarity. Um, the original Lion's Guide slogan, like my intention of it as a LinkedIn or, or Instagram thing was like, it, you know, Lion's always been a symbol of leadership, you know, power, you know, courage, obviously. Um, but the guide part of it was like, but at the same time, I'm no guru. I know what I know. Yeah. And I wanted to help point people to the resources that served me, right? The books, the podcasts, the, hey, this is what I've learned. Um, and then the leadership aspect of it is like, you know, well, the Lions Guy thing on courage, like the original slogan would say, like, you know, I know that my success in life has come from the times I acted courageously. Mm. And I know my failures have come from the times that I didn't. Yeah. Almost hard stop. And that's why the symbol of the lion and all that is important to me. Yeah. Um, and even, uh, and then finally the leadership aspect, which is like all the, you know, look, I, I'm thankful that there's so much talk about leadership today. A lot of it is in the context of leading people. But what I learned at Ground Zero in the boot camp, in Marine Corps boot camp, when we were getting taught the Marine Corps leadership traits and principles, because it, we're thinking in those classes, right? We're just recruits. Why are you teaching us leadership? We're not in charge of anyone. We're not going to be in charge of anyone for time. And and the answer to that was like, whether you're in charge of someone else or not, you're always in charge of yourself. And so that's to me where the third tenant with regard to leading the way comes in is because like, regardless of whether you're in charge of anyone, like you're in charge of you, like what you want from this life or your goals or objectives, like no one's going to give it to you. So you literally have to lead your own way to it. Yeah. And um and that's it. That's where courage, clarity, and leadership all comes in. And then even the, the lion, like why it is a white face, usually on a dark background, it's the symbol of clarity, like coming to the light, like, you know, shine a light on it and coming out of the darkness, coming out of that fog of war, getting clear about what you want, what's it gonna take to get it, and leading the way to get to it. Yeah, it, it's that messaging, or I shouldn't even say messaging, I, I, I would say having this like kind of North Star to always go to, mm-hmm. it was something I didn't realize for a long time. And I certainly wasn't looking, um, wasn't looking at my own things going, hey, like if, if you can't control your own, what's going on in your own world, how, you, you can't, there's, there's no way you can lead anybody else mm-hmm. because at the end of the day, people are going to see through this, right? This is just this facade. Like what are, what are you actually doing? What are you living? And it's something to be, uh, you know, fully transparent. I struggled a, a little bit having a show about, uh, habits and consequences, right? Because if you're not, and I, and I don't always, right. I'm always trying to be as open as possible, but if you're not living some of these same things and then, then, um, I mean, it's just, you know, it goes back to that word of, of, of being authentic, like mm-hmm. authenticity, you know, that's, uh, I said this before we started, uh, running, you know, there's a lot of people that have podcasts you, know, you get hit up with people like, Hey, come on the podcast and people come, people go, um, this is not an easy, easy world. Like if you think you're just going to start a podcast and you're going to have thousands of downloads, m- maybe some people do, it just hasn't been my experience. Mm-hmm. Um, but what I've, what I've really taken away from watching you, Dale, is, is I, I said the consistency, right? Mm-hmm. You know, you hear a lot of people in leadership talking about the process, right? Just embrace the process. And I've been impressed by the fact that you are extremely consistent and you're constantly putting stuff out there. And, and I'm going to guess that you're not always getting the feedback or the, the attention to each thing you're putting out that you might, you would hope or expect or, but that hasn't that hasn't changed the, your process. Yeah. Um, this, I'm, I'm going to guess this hasn't been the same as starting an IT company in the early two thousands. Mm. What has it been like to, to, to start Lions Guide? Uh, has it, has it met expectations? Has it fallen short? What has that felt like? Yeah. Um, I would say similar in some ways, like I, what I've been doing for the last year um, because really I'm still in my first year. I, I picked up my first paying client, you know, last March. So I would say as far as generating revenue, um, you know, but at the same time I've been experimenting. Um, I couldn't find a better word than coach. I kind of hated in the beginning using the word coach because of the, um, you know, the beach bodies, the, like the stuff that was like yeah. all this affiliate stuff that they were life coaches and all that stuff. And even when I told my wife, like, how I was pivoting. She's like, Oh, you're not going to be one of those life coaches. Are you? I'm like, yeah, 
I, I, I'm, I'll find another word for it. And, <laughs> and, um, and I couldn't because, you know, what I do today truly is coaching entrepreneurs, business owners, or other organizational leaders. And so, um, but what I want to serve is, you know, because people initially, like once I exited Corsica, uh, done, done, and kind of like announced my availability in February of 2021. Yeah. Um, I got a ton of requests for business coaching, right? right? Again, I can't say I'm excited about diving into spreadsheets and business meetings yeah. and all that. I'm not I'm not really excited about it. So what I tell people today is like, look, man, I understand you want business coaching. You want someone to tell you how to make that work. I don't want to work on your business. I want to work on you mm. because I know like if I can make you better, your business will get better. Trust me on that because your problems, uh, you know, what you're, what you're suffering is the fact that you need to deal with those problems of your business, right? That's that's your suffrage right there, that you've got this business and it's like riding a Bronco and bull and you've got all these problems and things to solve for. But at the end of the day, you're at its core. And because it's my belief that a business, especially if you're a founder, um, you know, it's a work of art, man. Like there is no right or wrong or playbook or whatever. There's only like what's working and what's not what what's not working. And I, I, I tell my entrepreneur clients, it's like, man, don't let anyone tell you, like, this is the way you're supposed to do it. Like, work towards what you your vision is. Like, yeah. be clear about what your vision, vision is, be honest about that, and work towards it. And, and, and why, like, to me, like, truth is such an important part of clarity, right? Because we got to solve for, like, the delusional optimism and things like that. Like, you might be saying, man, I'm going to make a billion bucks doing X. Well, if the world ain't buying X or the world doesn't need X— like you probably shouldn't die on X Hill, right? Yeah, yeah. And that's a part of like truth and honesty is a part of clarity is like you gotta be honest with yourself first and foremost. Like, hey man, maybe this X thing ain't really what I thought it was. What I thought it was. Yeah. And and but that doesn't mean you're done. You just kinda go, okay, well, what is it? Anyways, so I, I'm really passionate about you know, the performance of entrepreneurs, business owners, because being a leader is a hard job. Like it's a hard job to be in charge to be to have all that responsibility and there is no one thing you know like like there's a lot of five steps this and there's there is no one five or ten things here's 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 the secret it's everything like everything you do matters and it's when you're in charge and you're taking responsibility so i'm passionate about helping leaders get better like and and it's usually at transition points right like when you decide you're going to start your own business like you've got to level up right? Because you're not W2 anymore. Like work's going to follow you home because now work is life. And, yeah. um, and then like, once you start that business and have some success, well, before you know it, now you've got people working for you. So now there's a different requirement of people leadership and management that again, requires you to level up. Um, so I've, I've got a passion for helping leaders of any capacity level up or anybody because again back at its core we're all leaders like yeah. we we all in and the part i haven't said yet is like self leadership is the ugly word it's self discipline right mm -hmm. because all those leadership strategies and tactics that one might read in a book or hear or talk about in leading people and leading a successful organization or objective if you kind of change the flavor and talk about accountability, productivity, all those things, and we talk about them in the context of ourselves, that's what self-discipline is, yeah. right? So self-discipline is really just self-leadership, taking the responsibility and leading yourself to your goals and objectives. Um, but now some reason, like, discipline sometimes becomes that scary word. Um, but to me, it's really, you know. Yeah, well, you know, we, we talked about Jocko before before we went, went running, and he's got that line that discipline equals freedom. Yeah, yeah. And I used it even in in like twelve step rooms, yeah. right? Like when I was talking about alcohol, I was like, "Hey, it, you know, when we get down to the core of what we do, why we, you know, why we do the things that we do, and and we flip the script on on what discipline means, because a lot of people think that that word uh, means I'm. I'm not doing, you know, I'm, I'm keeping these other things that bring me joy away. When, but, but when you realize like how much freedom it actually offers, how many doors it opens, mm -hmm. um, and you can, and you can try and keep that in, in 
like uh, that you're being kind to yourself, which is a weird thing to say, like to be disciplined, you're actually being kind to yourself in a lot of di- different ways. Cause, and your time management, man, and this isn't me just being a, a deal hype man. Like it is impressive the, mm-hmm. the amount of things that you're fitting into a small, uh, a, well, you know, a 24 hour window. And with, I imagine the amount of discipline that that takes, um, I, I, you know, I was, I was following you go through the 75 hard mm. uh, and it's like, Jesus, Dale, like how much, how much are we going to do this? Like, this is, this is, you're, you're, you're very successful, but, but those same things that allow you to do the 75 hard is the same reason that you grew a business. You did all of these things. And that's just it, right? Like, you know, cause look, man, and, and we'll, we'll jump to kind of the, your, your theme for a minute, right? Like alcohol is a poison. Yeah. So. If you want to go do great things, does it make sense to poison yourself? <laughs> like, right. Like, uh, yeah, and, and like, cause people overcomplicate it, man. Yeah, and right. I think part of it is like when it comes to self self discipline or, or winning, you know. And again, that's I, I do honor Jocko in what they're doing because I think especially what Jocko did was bring leadership to the top. But everything he's saying, like also, because his company, Echelon Front, they're a leadership development company. Yeah. They, they're B2B, you know, in helping organizations get better leadership in the classic form. But at the same time, he discipline equals freedom. He lets it trickle down. You know, he he does have a platform that goes all the way down to the individual. Um, I was inspired by it. Like, I probably one of the first podcasts I listened to was his. And, yeah. and certainly, you know, I, I would say, like, definitely – inspired me especially to where i am today and for this last year and and everything with lion's guide because in the beginning i was kind of like oh, man there's all these guys out there doing this wait, wait a minute. but at the end of the day man uh we talked about this on the run like mediocrity is prevalent because yeah. it's so easy to be comfortable today and it's killing us like that's why there's so much mental health problems that's why we're addicted to so much more yeah. it's so accessible um and so i look today and go man not only is there not enough out there, like I want to be a soldier in a good fight, you know, I want to, and I want more soldiers in the good fight, you know, and we all need to be speaking up um, because it's my belief, like a lot of this stuff that we see, this negativity, um, especially being a tech guy, I'll tell you, tech is what? It's a, it's, it, it automates things, it scales things, it amplifies things. I'm going to tell you that technology has, has been weaponized to give voice to these negative elements, these, these, all the bads. And, and, and it's making it look like it's bigger than what it really is because it's amplified. Right. Um, and so I feel like we need more soldiers in a good fight speaking out to go, no, man, like we've had challenges. I've been depressed. Like I'm not, I'm not some superstar. Like I'm just like you, I, I get up, I, put my pants on one leg at a time like everyone else. I came from a broken home. I freaking, you know, like I've been all those things that you think prohibit you from being anything. Yeah. And that's, that's nonsense. Yeah. You know, in this world that, that we live in now where you, know, you hear the, you hear the terms like bro science, right? There's all of these things out there of, of, of that kind of military, that discipline. And that doesn't, those messages that you just spoke about don't come out very, very often. And I think that, I think there's, there needs to be more of that. Mm. There needs to be, and, and not just your story, but that story of, of, of actually struggling and acknowledging that. Um, cause we, we aren't all getting up at four thirty in the morning and, and doing whatever we're doing or, or, you know, just buying our next AR and, and getting tattoos and, and kicking drinking black rifle yeah, coffee, drinking black rifle <laughs> coffee and ki- kicking the shit out of life and everything's going great because that's not reality. And I think that's where the tech, that's where the social media, I think some of that has, has pushed that narrative, um, too far, too far, like a bridge too far. Yeah. Too far. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, but again, and I, I tell people like, dude, I, I, I'm, one thing I'm proud of recently is, um, you know, I've, I've kind of cut the phone out. It's good. And like, I got an alert on Sunday, I get the weekly like alert. I only touched my phone. Screen time was two total hours last week, Dude. which is significant. And, um, here's the thing, man, everyone's watching everybody else and they're judging themselves. Um, when, for example, when I stopped drinking, um, Everyone that I would tell that to made it about them right away. And I know you know this, but it's worth repeating for your audience, yeah. right? Like, and I had to go, no, 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 it's not about you. And I got no judgment. Drink, man. 
do you, right? But see, with social media, you're always watching everyone else. And just like those drinkers reflecting on me as a non-drinker, um, we do that. Like we look at the social media and we reflect that on ourselves going, well, I mean, look at all the fun they're having with life and why mm-hmm. is my life suck? Well, their life sucks too, like, you know, he in does. its own way. Um, it has its own suckiness, I guess I'll, I'll reframe that. But, um, and I think that's just it. Like, and, and that's again, probably back to why leadership so important to me is like your vision, your own clarity. It's all you like it's decide what that is. Um, and have the courage to lead your own way to it and stop worrying about what everyone else has. I like, like right now, honest man, I'm I'm turning that stuff off as much as I can because it, it hit me last week just kind of like, man, how much emotional energy it drains just being that plugged in all the time. You know what I mean? It's just like emotionally uh, – it, it it's a lot of energy that gets sucked out of you. I don't think you realize it. No, I, I – I think it takes a, it takes away our 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 free will. It it takes because you know you mentioned like it takes courage, right? Like it's very easy to go oh, like right, you, you started a, a business, uh, you you, you, did, you were successful. Tell me how you did it, and I'm going to model the, the exact same thing. And, and not just you, but anybody. And like you said, w- what worked for you may not work for somebody else. Like mm-hmm. we we know there's certain basic things that we have to follow. Uh, but if you think that you're not taking in endless amounts of content and it's not shaping your thought process, it's not shaping um, your decision making, well, you're, you're fucking insane. Like that's just not the way our brains work. There's a reason that engineers build these things the way they do. There's, you know, <laughs> like, yeah, I mean, we can go down that rabbit hole, but, but I like this idea of being courageous enough to have your own vision. And then following following that, no matter what else is kind of going around, mm-hmm. and I don't think it's the norm. Um, mm-hmm. I mean, I've struggled with it myself, right? Like mm-hmm. it's very easy to look at somebody, especially within that same field as you, mm-hmm. uh, and then just trying to copy that. But it's again, it's not authentic. Yeah. So well, it's like um, like one of the exercises I go through with clients is like establishing clarity of who you are like who how do you want people to describe you like when someone asks about jt and you're not around what do you want them to say yeah what what is that and and you take that and go okay when you interact with people like how do you want that to be described what makes you successful like in in defining like what that ideal version of you is so that you can always compare yourself to what you want the best of yourself to be yeah that's perfectly within your control, right? If you're running around, we'll stick with Jocko for a minute, and we talked about Goggins on the run. Like, if you run around, like, chasing what they're doing, you're never going to win. You know why? Because you're not them. They've done it. It's, it's That's right. them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What are What are you going to do? Like, what's the best version of you look like? And um, and aspire to that. Like, and, and again, bring clarity to that. Like, like, and, and that's not to say you ignore the world. You can go, man, I really like how Jocko gets up at 4.30 every day. Man, if I got up 4.30 every day, imagine the stuff I could get done. Sure. So the, what you're saying is the best version of you gets up at 4.30 every day. Yeah. To hell with what Jocko's doing. Yeah, That's right. Jocko. All right. The best version of you gets up 4.30 every day? Cool. How right. do we make that happen? Yeah. And and you you build, like again, just like building a business, like it's your own work of art, you know? Yeah. Um, it's and, and once you get that vision for it, start working towards it. So another thing we talked about on the, on the run is, is, is your involvement with, with 22 zero. Mm. Now I've had Dan Jarvis. He was one of the, I mean, it was as early on in, in the podcast or my podcast that he came on and, and I was, I was really kind of blown away with, with what they're doing as an organization. Um, I had no idea you, that you were involved with them. You had no idea that I've talked to Dan before. Mm. So it's, it's kind of this crazy world that we're out, you know, like, Hey, have you ever heard of these guys? Now this is is a ways away, obviously from the IT world. How did that process for you start? Like, because now now you're helping other people. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's it's going back to that that idea of service, like you said that that's something that's always kind of motivated you. Um, how did you get involved with these guys? And and then just maybe give a quick uh, like a breakdown of what twenty two zero is about and what kind of their mission is. Yeah. Um, 
You know, so first and foremost, um, I have, this is probably be my first time publicly talking about okay. the twenty two zero and my involvement with them. Um, I'm kind of, I'm actually talking like, not to timestamp this, but I'm talking to Dan Jarvis today because I want to help more. I, I, as with all things, right? And this is where kind of courage, taking action comes in. It's like, be curious and ask and inquire, and then you can make decisions, right? Like, yeah. and so like twenty two zero. I was networking for podcast guests. I ended up talking to this Marine veteran. It wasn't a great fit for the podcast, but in talking to him, he said, uh, yeah, man, I, um, I was, you know, a friend of mine, like he told me he had a bad story coming out of the Marine Corps. It was traumatic. Um, but he said, Hey, it, but I was talking to a guy, he told me to talk to 220 and I don't know what they did, but all I know is I sleep better now. And maybe it kind of being like the always trying to find optimization type of things, I, and it was like such a like a side comment that he said, and I said, "Whoa, whoa, whoa, stop there! What? What'd you do? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. what do you mean you're sleeping better?" He goes, "Man, I would wake myself up, and you know, and and I guess like the the trauma of how I got exited from the Marine Corps has has really been bothering me, and I didn't know it, and my friend recognized it, and I talked to these guys twenty two zero, and it a couple hours, and now I sleep like a baby, the best sleep sleep I ever had. In fact, I put it behind me, and now I'm wow. moving forward. I'm doing this, and I'm like." Who is this again? And right. so then I start getting in. So I so I call twenty two zero and um I went through a session with them and um because the fact is like we've all got traumas sure. some way shape or form and it might be something from it doesn't have to be from like combat or whatever but it could be childhood it could be whatever um but anyways I went through a session and um and it was amazing and what's cool about twenty two zero so there's a it, it it's it is to cure. PTSD. And now everyone's going, eh, it's not a cure. Burr, 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 burr. Yeah, yeah. It's highly effective. Um, we talked about some people I've served. Everyone I've served so far comes out of it like, whoa, what just happened? Wow. And what's awesome is it's a process. Dan Jarvis, um, who is Army vet, first responder, uh, Leo, law enforcement officer, um, has his own story. I'm going to have him on the podcast to tell it. He's been on yours, obviously, probably told it there. Um, but he saved himself through this treatment um, where he was suicidal. And um, long story short, once he got exposed to this process, which he calls TRP through 220, um, cured his PTSD and said, how do we get this out to other people? He started a nonprofit in 2018, 220, and enlists coaches today to go out and do the TRP process, uh, tactical resiliency protocol, um, with people suffering from PTS. Um, the beauty of it is we don't need to talk about the traumas, right? So mm. it's not exposure therapy. In fact, uh, CBT, you know, is is stated to have a fifteen cent, fifteen uh, percent success rate, right? So so that exposure therapy of sitting with a therapist and talking for twelve weeks and going all that, not put not putting all that stuff down, but the probability of success is documented documentedly low. Um and so, um so I went through this 220 process, cleared some stuff that was bothering me. Um and these are what are what is what is it? So when when traumas these are the things that like like they suck you away, right? You're not present. You're getting caught up in these negative emotions or this event that happened and you're reliving it, right? Um in our traumas, uh and this is all layman's version coming from me, but the way I understand it having worked and heard Dan and learned the process or whatever is our traumas that are that trigger our fight flight freeze system our amygdala our parasympathetic system um can get trapped in that part of our brain that's why it's so fresh right like if we have a traumatic event like it's so vivid still yeah. and the way Dan put it which I resonate with as, as a tech guy is like when these traumas get caught in our amygdala, um, it's like that is it's caught in our RAM. It's a, a caught in our random access memory. It's accessible. It's right there. Um, but we, what we want to do is it needs to process out to the rest of our brain into our long term memory, and so it can be recognized as a past event, right? So it's like a it, ghost. It's like a ghost. It's stuck between these two. Sure. Yeah. You know I mean? uh, yeah. Um, but, but it, it is like that. It's so present. That's why, you know, you see those memes at 4th July about, you know, be mindful of the fireworks. And sure. it has sure. like the little cartoon vet in the corner, you know, and, and that's because like to kind of use that imagery for a minute, like the traumas of war, which explosives or whatever, right. Triggers a fight, flight, freeze response. Um, but it's stuck, let's say, and 
fireworks going off because it's stuck in that random access memory can trigger, right? So there it is. It's yeah. fresh. It's yeah. accessible. It's in your random access memory. Um, what the TRP process does is, in essence, tells the brain, tells the subconscious that that's in the past and to let it go. And um, going through the process and every person I've run through the process with in training and after, it all has the same effect. We don't have to talk about the trauma, so you don't have to talk it out and and read it. I'll ask you to think about it and kind of rate it. And every person, you know, that I've done, and this is typical of everyone that's in 220, tells the same story. That when we start, we say, hey, think about the trauma, rating rate it zero to 10, um, from, you know, zero being no negative emotion at all, 10 being severely intense, Everyone starts, everyone I've worked with, seven, eight, nine, yeah. ten, you know. Um, say, okay, we go through the process. It can take up to two hours. Again, we don't need to talk about the trauma, but we're going to go through a process. Um, and then at the end, what I love about it and what made me want to become a coach for 22 and and be able to serve others in this is that at the end, you go, hey, okay, I want you to think about that negative event. Give me that. Suds rating zero to ten, zero being no negative emotion, ten being severely intense. Think about the event. How would you rate it? And everyone has that deer in the headlights look, and they look and they go zero, and they're confused, yeah. and they're like, "What did you just do?" <laughs> and and it's awesome. Um, you know, I've I've just recently got a super success story with a young marine who has a lifetime of trauma. Uh, we do a baseline score and then we do a postline score. He has a super high baseline score. Um, it, you know, because one of the things Dan's doing is doing a clinical study of this so we can take it and justify it and give yeah. it credibility. So, so we do a before and after score. Um, and he had a high score. Um, and now that score is nothing. And the guy sends me a text every other day thanking me, saying, man, I went through so much like therapy and this, that, and the other. And nothing, none of it compares to this. So it's it's highly effective. Uh, it, it it it's done pretty quickly. It's it's just awesome. Yeah. Um, and it's free to twenty two zero. It's free to veterans and first responders. Veterans, obviously, look. And again, I say because even 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 uh, the uh, client I was just referencing, like, had some reluctance to take it outside of their combat experience. But the, but but the truth is, like, we've got tra- there's traumas throughout our life. Um, so so. It, so I say, like, you said this on the run, right? Like, PTS, you know, veterans and first responders don't have PTS market cornered, right? Yeah. Like, uh, everyone has some sort of traumas in their life, likely. Um, it's just that combat veterans, and what I've learned since being with 220, they have more appreciation for. First responders have a lot of ongoing exposure to traumas um, because it's their job. Like, a veteran... Uh, combat veteran or serviceman for example they they may go to combat for a six-month deployment or more but they come back home sure they'll carry their traumas but a first responder they may be 20 years of trauma you know dozens throughout the year that that are compiling and, and building up um and then anyone like you know childhood traumas sure. coming up in a bad place you know or seeing something or whatever like and, it's everywhere and, and and that's and that's the that's part of the problem in the messaging. This is is getting people to understand that this is a chemical reaction. That this is a natural response to stress. Like we know what happens when trauma and stress, ha- you know, what happens in the brain. Um, and, and and for people to realize that that is it, it is a normal response to it. Now there's things you can do about it, um, but but I'm here to tell you by by saying to yourself and to others, um, I'm fine. Or it doesn't bother me. Well, you're just, you're not serving yourself, and and when people understand, and this almost goes back to the leadership thing, that when you are taking care of yourself and doing the the, the things to make you the healthiest version uh, of you, that the collateral of that is is a positive to everything around you. Mm-hmm. So so when we tell people like, hey, you you, you might want to get some help, if you're not going to do it for you, do it for the people that you love and that that love you, and and mm-hmm. and. I mean, what, what do you have to lose? And, and, and it's okay. It's okay to, to, to say I, I had trauma from a kid. It doesn't have to be from a combat thing. It doesn't have to be, um, from, from, you know, uh, responding to a shooting or something like that. Like it's, it's okay. It's yeah. All right. If it's, it, yeah. And if it's bothering you and it's, 
distracting you. Like a distraction is yeah. a word that I used for what 220 clear for me, which was like, it was like a distraction and it was pulling me, my focus away and, um, you know, and to be relieved of that. And that's the thing, like the folks I've done, like I've heard comments, like, I feel like I just had a rucksack taken off my back. Yeah. I, I've, I've never felt this free. I can move forward now. Like, like, I'm, I'm ready to move forward. Yeah, it, it is. It's it's it, yeah. It, I hear that a lot in my follow ups. You know, with with the folks I've gotten the opportunity to to serve in this capacity, and man, you know, uh, the fulfillment of it, just like the feeling that you're getting these t- like you were talking about like earlier, like getting the feedback on a podcast and yeah. stuff like that. And um, but but to for these guys telling me like in gals like you know that these people that were suffering like silently, um, and coming back and going wow, I can't thank you enough. Like, you know, and they're and just, it just, I don't know. It's very rewarding. Yeah. I imagine, I mean, as rewarding as it, as it is where the person goes, Hey, I can't get my Blackberry connect to my calendars and you walk away, you fix this and as a problem and you go, this is great. I, you went about leveling up. I imagine to, to, to help somebody work through some of these things and to lay down at night. And this isn't a thing of, of like gloating, but just to be part of that process has to be an amazing feeling. It, it really is. Yeah. I mean, it really is. And, um, and so my goal with it is, um, certainly anyone, anyone who could one, let's, let's hit the stigma for a minute. Sure. Right. There's certainly a stigma of, oh, well, your feelings are hurt or, oh, you can't handle the job or what yeah. it looked, man. Like you said, it's, 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 it's a perfectly human part of our system that we have the flight, fight, freeze, and it might get pushed to a limit where the meter gets stuck. And that's in essence what PTS, how we can look at that is that you just got something got stuck in there, right? And we got to process it. You, if you've not processed it to recognize it's in the past. So you're on alert, right? You're in your smoke detector's broken, right? Right. Your smoke detector's broken. It's going off. There's no, there's no smoke. It's just, you know, so that, and that's what the amygdala is doing when we're suffering from PTS. And so we've known what we know about how the brain works and these systems and letting it go. So, you know, I got, you just got to say it for the sake of the mission. Like if you are someone who's suffering from it, like just, it's okay. Like, yeah. you know, it's perfectly human. I've done, I've been, it, man, like these guys relieve me. I, I, you know, I've seen it over and over again and it could be, and trauma is different for everyone. It doesn't, again, need, you know, a, a 16 year old girl going to prom gets ketchup on her dress on the way. Like that's traumatic sure, for her. Sorry. Sure. Like there's different, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? Like, like, so, um, because why she's feeling helpless, right? Like, they're, they're, like what, what happens in traumas, right? Like there's a sense of fear or terror or helplessness or, you know, whatever, right? Those, those are traumas. Um, and so different folks have different traumas in different ways and that's perfectly human. But if it's something that's you're carrying with you and it's not been processed in the past. You can't talk about it. You can't think about it without being triggered or emotional yeah. Yeah, or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Um, then there's something to work out. Um, it's um, the human brain's funny, man. Like it doesn't care. The human brain doesn't care whether it was something like some combat thing. Like, you know, I, I we talked about some UFC stuff on the run and, and Chris Dawkins, uh, who I, I now consider a friend, he's been on here and he talks about like stepping into the cage to fight somebody. Now, these are heavyweights. Like these are just paid killers. Everyone that he's up against, and that doesn't scare him. That excites him. That gets him going. But what what scares the shit out of him is having to talk to the press. So a group mm. of people. Mm. So his brain, his fight or flight, is triggered by this event. You know mm. what I mean? So the brain doesn't care whether a saber toothed tiger is chasing you or you're. You just have to step up in front of five people. Uh, you know that scene. That chemical process happens and. And you're right. Um, people are, are quick to minimize what they've gone through. Uh, and when we talk to the veterans, we talk to the first responders, this whole thing of like suck it up and push on, that has a place. That has a place of being in combat, being in a specific situation mm. where you have an obje- objective that has to be completed. Mm. Now, after that, that suck up and press on um, will not serve you. Mm. I promise you, mm. I promise you that, that 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 will not serve you long term. So understanding that and then acknowledging that and also acknowledging that it may not be that it might be something small. Some of the, the firemen I've had on here, um, it wasn't the major event that was the trigger for him. It was something, God, I mean, I, I'll get choked up talking about it. I, I, I had uh, a gentleman on here, uh, Ben, it, and it was like it was the cry of a mother 
after their child had died or something. So it, he had been to a, a, a ton of other things, but there was this one thing that haunted the shit out of him afterwards, right? So you, that in itself shows like it may not be this one thing, but it's okay if it's something else. And it, and it's, again, it's expected. Like we're not meant to see these things. We're not meant to go through mm-hmm. trauma like at this level. Yeah, you know, I uh, just had uh, Mike uh, Sugru on. Have you- yeah, yeah, I've had him on, yeah. Yeah, and like his story as an example. Sure. And, and I love his mission to yep. break the stigma, you know, and um, but his was a great example of like he got triggered on the stand yeah. because he, he was an officer-involved shooting, you know, killed killed a assailant. Yep. He was it, her, heroic deed. He was awarded for it. But in the 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 review, they do a review of it, the brother had the the victim had a twin brother. Oh yeah, and he was sitting on the stand, and they were replaying the nine one one tape, and he's sitting there staring yeah. at the face of, of the man he he killed in the line of duty. It's brutal. And he broke down on the stand, and he got crap about that, but it triggered him, right? Like it it triggered, like he he went through a traumatic event, um, and it was on the stand where he got triggered and there it was, it was there and he got triggered. And, and afterwards he got kind of crap from his, his, uh, chain on it. And, um, like that he was faking it and, you know, whatever. And that's, and so I really appreciate Michael's mission to get out there and, and, and say, no, man, like you're perfectly human. Like, and if you have these feelings, um, and, and it, and it compounds, like we're talking about with the first responders, it's compounding. Um, so back to one, I'll serve anyone, um, twenty two zero. You can go through them. Um, they they will serve civilians, spouses of veterans and first responders. Veterans and first responders are free. There's no cost. Like so, wow. if you've got if you got this stuff rolling around your head, you don't have to talk about it. Like we can take you through a process and clear it out. You know. Um, the uh, in in why wouldn't you? Like yeah. you know what I mean? Like why wouldn't you? Yeah, right. What's and, the, what's the um, downside? Because the freedom on the other side of it, haven't felt it see it time and time again, man. Like, so what I'm trying to do is, um, one, find out how I can help 220 more just with my background. Um, but also, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I've been doing some local sessions and I'm trying, cause it is this, it's almost like uh, snake oil. It feels like in a way, right? Like, Oh, a two hour session, you're going to clear my PTS. Probably. Wow. I know that sounds crazy, but what do you got to lose? Sure. And um, so, um, you know, I've talked to like my local American Legion, VFW and, and the EMS services um, because I want to build the awareness that like we don't have to suffer in silence. There is something that's highly effective. Dan's doing his clinical study. Um, the folks I've been doing so far, I asked them, hey, would you help me help advocate that this is a, a real option for yeah. people? Um, and I think the other part of it is like um, some of the people I've served, like afterwards, like you don't have to talk about it, um, but afterwards, like they're free and they can talk about it, right? And I've served folks who afterwards were like, I've never told anyone that, wow. and it's crazy that I'm telling you right now. Like in in, but they but and like I told you on the run, I, I think a, a great. Because it, this certainly isn't dim- dismissing the need to unpack this stuff and deal with it, but kind of where I'm coming with this TRP EMP process from uh, 220 is that it, it might be hard for someone to get the full benefit of therapy, let's say, if they're not able to talk about it yeah. properly. Um, and maybe they're just kind of covering it up and, and you know, whatever. They're building layers on top of this trauma that they're that are still there. It's, it's, it's just not processed out. So... Um, I think it's it's just another tool in the tool belt, right? To to use and just again be be better, you yeah. know. And yeah. Shake this crap off. Yeah, man. It's a lot of weight to carry around, you know. Uh, again, you're being kind to yourself. That's what you're doing. You yeah. deserve it. Yeah. So and, and look, self care isn't selfish. A lot of people are like, you know, you, you, know, you take the airplane analogy, right? They, you you put the mask on yourself before you put it on others, right? And because if you got the mask on, you can serve a lot of lot right you yeah. can serve others but if if you don't put the mask on yourself you're limited in how many you'll be able to save so you know um 
a lot of people think the act of putting the mask on themselves is selfish, right? When they could be serving others and it couldn't be farther from the truth. It's the opposite. You know, you're not going to serve others well if you, you, know, you it goes to what's it saying? You can't pour from an empty cup, yeah. right? Um, so you've got to be in a position to serve others or accomplish your mission or whatever, you know? Um, so self-care isn't selfish. Yeah, man. It's all good shit. Yeah, yeah. All right, so we're going to make sure that there's there's links to this, and you know we talked a little bit on the run, but but um, if anyone wants to learn more about this, uh, you can either you can either hit me up, but but more importantly in the show notes we're going to have contacts or whatever you you know mm-hmm. how however we we work that out to um, uh, anyone who might might be interested in doing this, but uh, Dale. First, first time, like I said, first time I ever got to go and, and exercise with a guest prior. I appreciate that. <laughs> I, you know, I think I, I, I'm going to, from here on out, think I'm going to try and do this more often when possible because I think it, it opened up conversations before we sat down for the real one. Yeah. Um, to kind of get That's awesome. Yeah. No, I appreciate it. So thanks for everything you do, man. If someone wants to learn more about either 220 Lions Guide, uh, how do they get in touch with you? How do they find out more about it? Sure. Um, lionsguide.com for me. Um, the work I'm doing, I do one-on-one coaching. I do workshops. Um, it's, it's high performance coaching. So like say, I'm helping you unlock yourself and the rest will fall in place once you, you know, once you, once we fill your cup up and yeah. get you that clarity and all that stuff. Um, so I do that, like say in one-on-one I do, I'll do workshops. I'm actually putting together like day workshops now because i've been doing like over the course of uh, once a week for 12 weeks or whatever um now i'm doing like one days and so you can kind of knock that out because my workshops have turned into masterminds and i feel like i want to get a good core coverage and then once people go through the like the core curriculum so to speak then they can come on into the mastermind so i want to accelerate the availability of of more people to work together um, because we're, we're all in the same boat, man. Yeah. So being able to share your growth with others is really a force multiplier. Um, so I, I, I really enjoy doing that. Um, so that's lionsguide.com. If you're interested, book a call with me and we'll figure out how I can serve you. Um, or if not, I'll help point you in the right direction. And then uh, 220 nonprofit, 220.org. Check it out. And... That's it. Otherwise, I'm on all the socials. Search for Lions Guide or Dale Walls. And yeah. I'm He's there. on it, but not much. Maybe two hours a week. So. <laughs> right, I am now. <laughs> right. I appreciate it, brother. Yeah, thank you. Awesome. Appreciate you having me. Everybody, that's a wrap. Like always, thanks again for checking us out. This show is brought to you by the team here at Consequence of Habit and is an arm of our 501c3 nonprofit. The show is produced and edited by the one and only Anthony Palmer. Is part of the Palm Tree Pod Company network of podcasts. That's it. I'll catch you guys next week.